Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and over at Pop Culture Explained, I told everybody that I was gonna make a video on the Darkhold Explained. But something that I wanna clarify here, because some people have asked this, and rightfully so, whether or not Pop Culture Explained and Comics Explained are exceedingly similar, not really. So Comics Explained, this is a comic book channel. And one of the things that I've wanted to focus on here recently was to create a clear delineation between focusing on like geek culture slash movies and stuff like that, and focusing on comics, because I wanna expand the overall kind of uh, explained brand, right? I mean. I don't wanna be like fine bros and copyrighted. I think that's a stupid decision. In terms of expanding the idea of like explaining things, um, I want Comics Explained to focus exclusively on comics and nothing else, right? It's only ever really comics. The only exception to that might be if I like react to a trailer, right? Like a, an amazing trailer drops and I make like a little video for it as I've done before. But in terms of talking about like comic book themed movies, TV shows, stuff like that, that's what Pop Culture Explained is for. The other thing we do there is we actually explain like a bunch of celebrities and stuff like that, right? We're kind of trying to figure out what works, what all you guys are interested in, because trying to figure out what you guys like is a very difficult task for a YouTuber. <laughs> it really is just trial and error, but that's an explanation that I wanted to get out there, right? Comics Explained is only just comics, and that's it. And so in this video, what I wanna do here is I wanna explain the Darkhold concept within Marvel Comics. Now, the Darkhold originally appeared back in Marvel Spotlight number four in 1972, and it was created by Jerry Conway and Mike Plute. But here's the thing to understand, Marvel Spotlight back in the 1970s was an idea that was created by Stan Lee, and it's what, what's basically called a test bed or a tryout comic. And what this means is that when Marvel was off to the races, right, when they were just huge, after like Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, the Avengers, and stuff like that, it became pretty obvious that it was very expensive to try their hand at releasing a comic if it failed, right? If it just didn't really sell. There's the cost of printing the comic, the cost of getting it shipped out, the, the, the cost of advertising it, all that kind of stuff. There was a lot that went into it. And so when Stan Lee became the president and publisher of Marvel, he had this great idea of saying, okay, let's bring back the anthology series, like the old action comics stories when Superman first showed up or the old detective comic stories. You know, DC Showcase did the exact same thing, you know, back in the, the 1950s when they first introduced Barry Allen. And let's basically create a series of books where all we do is introduce people to characters and teams based on those books. And we use a combination of book sales as well as fan write-ins to determine whether or not that book is popular. It's why The Amazing Spider-Man appeared in Amazing Fantasy because it was a test bed back at that point in time. Marvel didn't know if it was going to work. It turned out to be one of the best choices they ever made and Spider-Man got his own solo series. But nonetheless, Focusing on the dark hole, the way this plays out is that in the early days of Marvel Comics, looking to Silver Surfer Annual Number no. 2, in the early days of Marvel Comics, what you had was an Earth that was occupied by the Elder Gods. Now, these Elder Gods came into existence by way of a guy who was known as the Demiurge, and the Demiurge is kind of like the sentience of all of Earth's ecosystems, more or less. And so he spawned almost every concept on Earth that we're aware of. So like Gaia, who's basically like Mother Earth in Marvel Comics, was born from Demiurge. When Demiurge came into existence, he kind of took his essence, his life force more or less, and spread it throughout the world, which gave birth in the form of these Elder Gods, who were these wildly powerful cosmic beings. But as time went on, the Elder Gods basically devolved into evil, right? They basically just became these, these terrible evil beings. The only ones who didn't were Ashtur and Gaia. But because everybody else had fallen, the most powerful of the evil Elder Gods was basically Cthum. And so what you ended up having was in order to purge the earth of these evil Elder Gods, and then in turn give Earth the ability to actually create life-sustaining beings, so humans and animals and so on and so forth, and to turn it into a legitimately habitable planet, Gaia ended up beseeching Demiurge to give her the ability to have a child, which she did, who became known as a tomb. And this child basically transformed into what was called the Demigorge, or the God Eater, and quite literally consumed all these different Elder Gods across the entirety of Earth. Now, some of these Elder Gods were not consumed, and they basically just ended up fleeing. Cthon was one of those. He took off to his own dimension, and basically basically has resided there ever since. But before he left, he created what were called the Scrolls of Cthon, which are basically just all the knowledge and information he had on his abilities to manipulate dark magic that could be put on Earth and then used as a vessel for his return at some future point in time. Meaning, if somebody were to pick up the Darkhold and start reading it, assuming that they were somebody who was compatible with his ability to come back, that he'd be able to possess them and then ultimately cast a spell that would allow his him, him to enter the, the earthly realm in a proper form. That person, of course, we know to be the Scarlet witch, right? She's kind of the person that was prophesized to be the vector by which uh, Cthon would ultimately come back. Now, it's never really happened in Marvel Comics. It's come close a couple times, and the closest we ever actually got to that in Marvel was during the Secret Empire event, when she was fully possessed by 
a thump. Up to that point, she was possessed like momentarily, or it was for a short amount of time and almost cast the spell. So like Beast of the X-Men, for example, basically stopped the whole thing from happening and like saved Wanda. And, and he's tried to make his way back a couple times, but it was never really anything of, of any major significance, I don't think, in, in comparison to the events of Secret Empire. But the important thing here is that this series of spells and so on were originally written in flesh, and it remained that way for quite some time in Marvel Comics. Now, one of the big things that happened out of this really came by way of the second host. And the reason why I say that is because for those of you guys who are not familiar with what the hosts are in Marvel Comics, that if the Elder Gods came into existence and then were ultimately destroyed, that life itself just simply began to evolve as we would normally expect it to, right? Now, there's been different iterations in Marvel Comics as to how humans came into existence, but no matter how you slice it, humans began to come into existence. And so when humans began to evolve, you had the arrival of the Celestials on Earth, who basically split a group of humans into thirds and then, you know, manipulated their genes. And that's where you get the Eternals, the Deviants, and that's where mutants come from. And so what ended up happening is that uh, when in the early days of human existence, the Kingdom of Atlantis served as like this major trading hub on Earth, right? So imagine like we here on the planet Earth all go to Atlantis whenever we want to like trade stuff or build up our empires and different things like that. And so what it basically led to was this being a, a massive kingdom. Now, this basically meant that humans were ultimately subjugated by deviants and the Eternals just kind of abandoned their role as people who were supposed to protect humans from the deviants. This led to the Celestials showing up a second time to examine their experiments, right? To see if the Eternals had lived up to the, the role they were supposed to play, to see what became of the deviants and to see whether or not the genes of baseline humans had manifested into developing powers. When they showed up, they realized nothing was what it was supposed to be, right? The deviants were basically supposed to die off relatively fast. They didn't. They just kept on living on. They enslaved humans and Eternals had abandoned their role of protecting humans. And so what ended up happening was that during the second host, the Deviants attacked the Celestials and the Celestials in turn wiped out most of the Deviants and then sunk Atlantis in what's called the Great Cataclysm, which you'll probably see referenced in the Eternals film. Uh, the, the Eternals themselves were so terrified of what had happened that either some of them fled Earth entirely or they went back to their role of protecting humans like they were supposed to and then ultimately left Earth, right? And then settled on Saturn's moon Titan. And that's where you get Thanos and his brother Eros. Of course, all that stuff's covered in like the Thanos Rising storyline, uh, the original Eternals run by uh, Jack Kirby. It's, it's the, the whole idea of the Great Cataclysm and the Second Host, the Deviants, the Eternals, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of scattered all over the place. The meat and potatoes are in Jack Kirby's original Eternals run, but his original run's kind of been retold multiple times over the years by different writers and reinterpreted. So you can kind of take it for what it's worth. But the important thing here is that the Dark Holders were basically people who served a, a guy by the name of Thulsa Doom. And Thulsa Doom was essentially just like an enemy of Conan the Barbarian and Cole from back in the day. But the, the thing about this was that following the defeat of Thulsa Doom and his essential destruction, what they had done is they had taken the Darkhold as it existed at the time in the form of just basically being written, being written in flesh. And they took a guy by the name of Vernay and then transformed him into the first vampire. Now, following the Great Cataclysm, Varney had essentially just gone underground, right? He had just gone dormant. He had spawned a series of vampires, but all the other vampires except for him had basically died. And so when he re-emerged again uh, during the Hyborian Age, which is about 10,000 BC, uh, he basically started creating more vampires across the world. And that's where vampires come from in Marvel Comics. Werewolves also come from the Darkhold. And that's largely how the Darkhold existed throughout Marvel Comics. Uh, it's one of these things where it would just pop up occasionally and be used by a particular group to achieve a particular goal, not fully understanding what it was that they were doing. But in terms of the Darkhold becoming what we know it today, which is to say no longer being a concept that was recorded over the course of scrolls or flesh and in turn being transcribed into book form, that came from Morgan Le Fay. So to kind of wind things back a little bit, prior to the sinking of Atlantis, Morgan Le Fay was a woman who was basically supposed to be trained at a place called the House of Virgins, and she was supposed to become what, what they referred to as a sea princess. All that really meant is that she would essentially be trained to become a witch, is really all it meant. Uh, but she resided on the, the island of Avalon. Now, of course, Avalon, a lot of you guys know as the King Arthur mythos, but alongside her, or at least in her general vicinity was a guy by the name of Mirrodin. Now Mirrodin had become aware or at least, you know, learned of these prophecies of what would become the great cataclysm. So the second host of the celestials obliterating uh, the kingdom of Atlantis and sinking it. And so what ended up happening is that in the aftermath of all of that, Morgan Le Fay and Mirrodin ended up on the Isle of Britain. Now, ultimately the I island of Avalon survived as well and was eventually moved to the other world, right? So just, that's where like King Arthur and all those guys basically occupied after their escapades in Britain proper. But what you ended up having here was Mirrodin changing his name to Merlin 
Berlin, and then Morgan Le Fay basically going on to become essentially a villain. Now, what ended up happening here is Morgan Le Fay, along with the Dark Holders, had basically intended to resurrect uh, Cathon or bring Cathon into the earthly realm and then force him to do the bidding for them, right? To help them achieve their own goals because they were looking to topple Merlin and that kind of stuff. Ultimately, Cathon was simply too powerful for them to contain. And so before he could be completely unleashed onto Earth, what ended up happening is that uh, Morgan Le Fay basically took the spirit or the essence of Cathon and then stuck him inside Wondergore Mountain where he remained essentially ever since. Now, this became important because of the fact that over the years, different things had taken place where different people had like copied the Darkhold text, different people had, had discovered these copies or like different versions were made or something similar to it, like the Necronomicon or something along those lines. But the actual book of the Darkhold did kind of pass from person to person, but Cthon being stuck inside the of Wondergore Mountain became significant because as we know from our X-Men history that we've talked about here on Comics Explained so many times before, uh, that in the aftermath, of World War II that uh, Eric Eric Lyncher and Magda ended up moving to, you know, moving out to Eastern Europe, more or less, and settling down and having a daughter, uh, Anya. Now, when Anya was killed by the townspeople and Eric's powers manifested for the first time, and then he started calling himself Magneto, Magda took off running, un completely unaware of the fact that she was pregnant with twins, Pietro and Wanda Maximoff. And so she took up residence in Wondergore Mountain and ultimately gave birth to the twins. Now, there was this great big, huge, crazy series of stories that Marvel did where they tried to like reveal the fact that that Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch were actually Magneto's kids. That was the original Vision and Scarlet Witch series written by Bill Mantlo. And then they tried to go back and undo it and all that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, what's important here is that when Wanda was born in Wondagore Mountain, that Cthone picked up on her birth and realized how powerful she would become, that she was the perfect person for him to enter into the earthly plane. And so she was touched with a portion of Cthone's power so that when her when she developed her abilities, she would basically learn how to use what was called K chaos magic, or the magic that was part and parcel to Cthone himself, making her one of the most powerful beings to ever exist in the history of Marvel Comics when she was at her peak, right? When it was House of M's Scarlet Witch. But as for the Darkhold itself, again, it's kind of passed from location to location. Even people like the High Evolutionary, the guy who basically ran Wondagore Mountain, and the person that Magda took up residence with while she was giving birth to the twins. A guy, you know, th this guy basically just focuses on, like, speeding up people's evolution. He's mastered his own evolution. He's almost demigod powerful. He's, he's a super powerful character. Uh, but it just kind of passed to him, it's passed to Doctor Doom. It's been used by a multitude of different people, right? During the rise of the Midnight Suns, you had a you had the book reappearing, right? So there, it's appeared multiple times. More recently, it was a big event during the the Carnage Saga, and I can actually cover that if you guys are interested. But for the Darkhold, the the long and short of this is that this is a book that contains all the powerful spells and incantations that belong to Cthone, and those individuals who can harness the power of the Darkhold and use it effectively without being corrupted by it can become incredibly powerful. The problem with this is it's incredibly difficult to use the book and not become controlled by it, not become manipulated by it, and basically becoming a subservient of Cthone. Because Cthone is always looking to return to the earthly plane. And so if you or I put, uh, picked up the book with no magical prowess whatsoever, and we were not powerful enough to overcome the influence of Cthone, he would seize control of us and then have us carry out his bidding, whatever that bidding happens to be, which is usually trying to find some way to bring him back into the earthly plane. But again, it's a pretty powerful artifact. It just, it doesn't show up a ton in any real meaningful way in Marvel Comics. I mean, I guess it does show up a lot, but not for any real meaningful moments. It just has a few things here and there. The real big thing that really comes to the Darkhold is Cthon. That's where a lot of the meat and potatoes is focused when it comes to those particular stories that involve the Darkhold itself. Now, we have seen it appear in like the Marvel related television shows. So it was in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., it was in The Runaways, and of course, you know, we also know where it's appeared as well, or at least seems to have appeared as well in, uh, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So it's a cool concept. You know, what Marvel will do with it, I don't know. I really have no earthly clue what they're going to do with this book. I think they'll end up doing quite a few things, and I think it'll actually become pretty significant in the realm of Doctor Strange. We know that, like, to a degree, there seem to be aspects of it, right? The book of, of Kaecilius, which is basically the, the book that we saw in Doctor Strange 1, uh, which seemed to basically take pages from the Darkhold, but was not actually the Darkhold itself. Uh, this is definitely one of those books where, if it does exist in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Doctor Strange would be smart to lock it away under every conceivable spell he can think of and make sure nobody could ever get their hands on it because if the wrong person gets their hands on it they're going to unleash Cthon and if you guys thought Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet is bad he has nothing on Cthon whatsoever not even a not even not even close right not one bit not even a little bit so with that being said guys we're going to bring this video to an end uh, if you guys are new here to Comics Explained make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps if you guys enjoyed this video make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later peace